Hey YouTube, what if you could have only five specific bushcraft or camping tools for the rest of your life? Which ones would you bet the rest of your life on? What five would you choose? How would you even decide? In Five to Survive, we ask experts what tools they would choose. We pick their brains about why and give you five things to consider adding to your gear. We also learn a little about the skills you need to use those tools. Whether you learn something or just enjoy listening to outdoor geeks talking about their gear, please subscribe and hit the notification button. We also have a companion podcast that includes all of the discussion in the YouTube episodes, but it includes more in-depth discussion with the experts, the why behind their what of their choices, and some laughs. I'm Joe Bassett, this is Valiant Outfitters, and you're about to discover Five to Survive. This episode of Five to Survive is about cutting tools, and our guest is Jason Hunt. He's the founder and owner of Campcraft Outdoors. He's written several books, including his most recent, The Gospel of Survival. He also contributes to the magazine's Backwoods Survival Guide and Prepper Survival Guide. He draws on his experience as a wilderness emergency medicine instructor, martial arts expert, firefighter, and ordained minister with a degree in theology to teach a unique approach to survival and self-reliance skills. Frankly, I wish he'd leave some talent for the rest of us. I'm Joe Bassett, and this is Valiant Outfitters. You're about to discover Five to Survive. Hey, Jason, welcome to Valiant Outfitters, Five to Survive. Uh, there really aren't words for me to describe how excited that you're among our first guests. Man, I'm really appreciative to be here. Thanks for having me. That's my pleasure. Um, you know, we talked about it for a while, and I've really enjoyed getting to know you through uh, some of the things we've done uh, with Creek's class on uh, Outdoor Core. Uh, and I've really enjoyed your book, uh, The Gospel of Survival. It's something that uh, I had had on my heart for a while but wasn't able to put words to. And I love that concept that you use of the biblical festivals, Passover and Pentecost and Sukkot, um, as a mandate for Christians to prepare. It's something I had never really considered. And also your idea of God's everyday carry. Can you unpack a little bit of those festivals uh, for people that might not be familiar with them? Sure. So um, most people are familiar with Moses and the Red Sea crossing and all the plagues that took place during the Passover festival. Um, what we don't really think of as much is the context of the people that were enduring the festival. Um, God has just sent a whole bunch of plagues against all these people. And while the Hebrews were oppressed and they were slaves, they lived daily just like most of us do. They went to the market every day. They all had their uh, various jobs. Um, and while, yes, a great many were slaves, not everyone was a slave. They still had regular work hours and everything. Um, so it's not like they were working 24-7. Well, in the midst of these plagues, which would be man-made or natural disasters or various crisis situations to to us today um they had to endure it and while they were not specifically affected by any of these plagues they saw everyone around them or their employers being affected by all these plagues and they're seeing death and destruction all around them and so uh, when they got that call in the middle of the night after a period of weeks going by to get up and gather their stuff and get out of town right now in the middle of the night, well, that's a bug out. They suddenly had to grab everything they could carry and bug out and get out of town. Well, that's it. They took everything they could, all their belongings, even their bread dough. It says their bread dough was thrown on boards and put on their shoulders and mm -hmm. they walked it out of town. Um, their neighbors, which were Egyptians and non-Hebrew non people, uh, a rabble of them, they started throwing gold and silver at them, giving them money just to get them out of town so they did not have to endure any more of these plagues. So in the midst of that, it says they walked about a day's walk, roughly 25 26 miles mm -hmm. 
before they had their first camp. Now, can you imagine taking all of your family, uh, all of your livestock, practically everything you own on a cart and walking 25 miles in the middle of, from starting in the middle of the night, just walking. That's no fun. I've done 17 miles on more than one occasion, just with 25 pounds on my back. And that was horrible. So I can't imagine taking my wife, my kids, my dog and everything else. So that is a true sense of a bug out in an emergency situation. And then of course we have a story of um, they were being chased through the desert after a couple days. Pharaoh had a change of heart and went after them. They crossed the Red Sea and they were able to make it successfully out of danger. Well, that leads us over into Pentecost. They had to travel across the desert all the way to Mount Sinai. Well, now they're learning to live off the resources they took from the bug out and live on them for 50 days as they're traveling across this wilderness and desert environment to meet with God out in the middle of the woods. So they learned a lot of hardship. And what's the Bible revealed to us? They did nothing but complain every step of the way. <laughs> right. They didn't like the food. They didn't like the water quality. They didn't like this. It, it was too hot. It's too sandy. Can't we go back? Real things that we will endure most of us do when we have a bad camping experience uh -huh. well god was showing them hey quit your grumbling this is life you'll get through it i'm going to show you the way so there's a whole learning process in that so they're learning to become more self-reliant as a people and then um, fast forward we know that they sinned and didn't get into their promised land right away mm -hmm. so they end up walking in big circles for 40 years until that generation passed away and the next generation could take over to seize the land as they were instructed. And then eventually they end up with this festival called Sukkot. And the Sukkot festival is basically uh, a reestablishment of paradise on earth. Uh, it's really just relying on your relationship with God. You've come through all these trials, you've lived the Christian life, if you will, and it's now time to just rest from your work and rest in the peace and presence of God. Well, the Bible describes celebrating that festival as building a debris shelter and living in it for an entire week. Mm -hmm. That didn't sound like we're resting in the presence of God, <laughs> but that's exactly what the Bible describes. Uh, God said that if we will take the time to build that shelter out of natural materials, off the landscape, we take the harvest of the seasonal harvest of the time which this is about a september october festival so a fall harvest we take those things and we decorate it and we eat and partake of the land that he promises to meet with us in the midst of that celebration and it said specifically in the book of revelation this is the only appointed festival mm -hmm. that we will do even after christ returns so it's that important of a festival so what these do is these three festivals specifically train us as a people to endure hardship and they train us in survival techniques and bushcraft techniques. And that's really how I come to do them. I was a pastor for 15 years and I started doing the biblical festivals and I realized pretty quick, I don't have enough skills. I need to learn how to build a better shelter, make fires better because I was uncomfortable when I was out there doing it. So I started training in survival and I got into biblical survival, and that's kind of what I did. Well, it was as I read your book, and I read, you know, those first few chapters where you outline a lot of this, I, I couldn't help but chuckle at how over the last decade or so, we've seen this kind of this grassroots um, emphasis on self-reliance and teaching these survival skills, or even where you talk about, you know, yeah, you know, for those of us that have experienced a debris hut or even just camping, mm -hmm. it is restful. You know, it. My my wife jokes that her idea of camping is a dirty room at a Holiday Inn. <laughs> you know, yeah. where you know I, you know, give me my tarp and my ferro rod, and mm -hmm. I'm set to go. Uh, and 
it's, I believe it's true. You can't be in the woods and in a bad mood at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I watched your progression here, I like this, the Passover, there was the bug out, which it, they really didn't prepare for. They had no preparation for it. Mm -hmm. And then they have, you know, Pentecost and where you talked about, you know, they're complaining. I joke that the reason that God had them go around Jericho in silence was just to get them to be quiet for a little while. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and, but then we move out of that to, all right, you're in the promised land, but you need to keep these skills going and his remembrance of those festivals. Um, I just, I loved how you outlined that and then to put it against the background of what we see going on today, you know, and none of us really knows what's coming in the specifics, but just the fact that people, uh, regardless of their faith belief, you're, you're seeing this movement of that, and you just can't help but wonder what God would be doing in something like that. Um, another part that I really appreciated was your chapter on enduring trouble. And it was funny because you kind of like dope slapped me in that chapter because mm -hmm. I thought, all right, enduring trouble. And then you, you like make this pivot in about, you know, the second or third page to teaching survival skills to young people and children. Tell me a little bit about what brought you there with the um, Enduring Trouble and Teaching Children packaged together. Well, um, unless we raise a child in the way they should go, mm -hmm. you know, when they're older, they won't depart from it, right? That's what the Proverbs tell us. And um, the only way we can successfully endure trouble as a tribe, if you will, is to rely on one another and to train one another. And so we start with the kids. And so it is often easier to reach a child than it is the hardened adult. And we can share our skills and ignite that passion for the outdoors in our young people. And that often draws the parents in. That was something we always used in our martial arts. I ran martial arts schools. Mm -hmm. And we knew that if we could get the kids, well, the parents are gonna have to bring them every week. Right. So eventually the parents might get hooked too. Same kind of concept. Uh, we reach out to the kids and get them uh, developing that passion, and we do so in a faith-based environment. Um, that's just going to ignite that passion in the kids, which will hopefully kindle that flame in the parents as well. And then we can all truly endure that trouble together, being on the same page. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was speaking with a mom uh, just within the last day or two, and she was telling me a story about how her husband gave her the book Wild at Heart and said, if you want to understand me, read this book. Mm -hmm. And then um, after reading the book, she ended up having two children, both of them boys. <laughs> and she said one of them climbed the tree and was easily 20 or 30 feet up the tree and started to call, hey, mom, I need help. And the book came back to her of don't tell them to be careful. Don't tell them to be careful. Don't, you know, and really how she had to go to this place of letting him endure that hardship of getting him out of the situation that he was in. And as, as a man, I said to her, that is going to have such far reaching positive consequences for him learning. All right, I got myself into this. I'm going to get myself out of this. And it's not about the being careful. It's about that taking the risk and being able to endure those things. So I really appreciated that chapter, particularly as, you know, a former teacher. And I, I used to, you know, tell the kids, I'm not here to teach you technology. Yeah. I'm here to teach you how to live life. Technology is just the thing that we have in common. Um, awesome. I mean, I could go on all day with this stuff, but I don't want to keep you too long. Um, I want to get specifically to our five to survive our cutting tools. And okay. I've explained a little bit to you about the rules of engagement here, but I'm going to go over them again. Um, and I've asked you to consider one tool in each of five categories that you would want to have in your bushcraft or survival gear. If you could have only one in each of those categories, essentially for the rest of your life. Uh, these aren't tools that you necessarily have in your bug out bag or everyday carry, though there is one that is specifically for everyday carry, but you might have it in your gear shed or even just keep it at base camp. Within each category, you're given leeway to choose any tool you feel fits the category. And these are the categories. One, a folding pocket knife, uh, which also, you know, could be everyday carry. A small fixed blade knife, such as a neck knife or however you would define it. 
a large fixed blade knife, you know, such as what we think of as a bushcraft, a belt carry kind of knife, an axe, a hatchet or a tomahawk, and a saw. Now, when I did this with Brian Leggett, uh, he kind of called me out that I left some categories out, so I allowed a wild card, and I've decided to keep that. So I'll let you have a wild card tool. So we'll end up with probably six. Um, and really, it was Brian's polite way of saying, Joe, that's a boneheaded list of categories. Do you even bushcraft? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to let you add that. Or it could also be something you say, hey, I think you should have two in one of these categories, and these are the two that I'd have. Um, so you'll have that wild card tool. And then also we'll talk a little bit about the why behind your what of why you selected those. Um, you might discuss a little bit about grind or the ergonomics or is it being a multitasking tool. And I'm going to include uh, a link for all of these that you list. Um, and you can list your own gear if you want to. Uh, we're not above self-promotion and self-aggrandizement here. Uh, but those are usually the ones that I'll push back on. I'm also going to make sure, I meant to mention this earlier, I'll also make sure to link for your um, book, particularly The Gospel of Survival, uh, but your others as well uh, that I haven't gotten to yet. Uh, but we'll list those. So if you're ready to get to it, let's go. Yeah, I am ready. And I'm going to let you know right now, I'm going to throw all your categories into chaos. <laughs> I carry. I do not carry the same knife every single day. Uh, I use all my tools on rotations, um, probably because I just buy too many things. Um, I'm usually a tool heavy kind of person, uh -huh. but um, when it comes to the day to day, I go really light. So I've got multiple options, and I'll explain everyone why. Um, but I'll start with my pocket knife. Okay. So I've got. A simple Ontario, okay. Um, just a simple Ontario pocket knife. This is the Model One, and nothing fancy about it. It's got a simple, you know, uh, frame lock on it. It's cheap, and that's why I carry this. It's about eighteen twenty dollars, I think, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, I like this size. It's got the thumb stud fits in my hand nice and it'll do bushcraft and survival related tasks i have batoned with this maybe pieces of fat wood but it's nothing that you're going to want to baton with because of the lock mechanism but i look at this as a ditch knife so if i need to do something um remember i have a martial arts background spanning 35 years so everything i choose has to be able to fight so not that i've been in any knife fights I've been held up at knife point a couple times and had to defend myself. Uh, that was during ministry, by the way. Funny. But uh, anyway, every knife I have has to be able to do some defense. And this one does. And the way I look at it, if I went into a non-permissive environment or this was taken from me or I lost it or I broke it, I'm not out much. You know, it's an $18, $20 knife. Not a big deal. So this is one of my preferred carries for my pocket knife. I also like the Emerson designed uh, Kershaw's. Mm -hmm. yep. Emerson Wave, and they're nice, another inexpensive knife. So if I don't have this one, I'm gonna have one of those more often than not. Now my EDC blade for my fixed blades, uh, this is a Woody Smith knife. And again, this one's pretty small. Mm -hmm. It's legal, three inch blade. Uh, fits good in my hand. And this is a more covert. This is my business EDC. This is my fancy one, right? So um, if I'm going in town, I'm going to have this with me more often than not. Um, of course, I live pretty far out in the country. So um, I'm going to plan if I know I'm going to, um, and there are more I can get into, by the way. Um, if I know I'm going somewhere like the DMV, I actually carry a knife inside my phone case and it gets through metal detectors. Okay. So I do that kind of stuff. Um, I'm real urban survival oriented. If I know I'm going into an urban environment, I'm planning for that. I'm going to have my phone knife. I'm going to have this. If I'm out here in the country or just going around shopping on the day to day, I'm going to have this. And um, again, thin small profiles that's kind of where i'm at 
So. I'm glad you brought that up because this is neat to do this uh, so close to the one I do with Brian over in the UK because he mentioned all the restrictions he has yeah. on what he can carry and how, it, how restrictive it is. Um, so I'm fascinated by what you, you have that everyday carry fixed blade. How do you carry that? I carry that right on my waist. So this fixed blade just go, it's got one of these, uh, what is it, a pull the dot snap on it. Right. And so it just goes right over my belt and I carry it right at my waist level so where I can grab it right here and just deploy. Um, I carry it midline more often than not, kind of canted. It just fits. That's just the way this one's designed. But you can put it anywhere around your whole waist if that's your option. Um, the pocket knife, I don't put in my top pocket. I actually have, you know, I wear cargo pants. I'm right. rock, uh, mostly cargo pants. Um, I always carry this down on my leg a little bit because most people, especially if they're used to looking or patting people down, they feel the pockets up around the waist, but they often omit leg pockets. Uh, and on all my pants, I have a, like a hidden leg pocket that goes behind the main cargo pocket. And so this just drops in there real nicely. So if they go and squeeze or anything, it's often overlooked. So just, you gotta be sketchy if you're gonna carry knives in town. It's just yeah. how it is. So, and I'm a sketchy guy when it comes to that stuff. So. Well, and that brings up another question. And, you know, having lived in Kentucky for a while, I understand you know, where you live and the, and the culture there. But when you're in town, and you have that fixed blade knife on, do you ever get questions whether, you know, people just genuinely curious or maybe push back on it? Never, not yet. Um, now, if I'm carrying, we'll get to my big knife. I carry this in town. You know where I live. Mm -hmm. I have to go, I carry this in downtown Louisville, you know, so I've gotten some looks without question in Texas Roadhouse and going out they're like, they're just more fascinated by it. And they're like, wow, he's brave carrying that. Uh -huh. But law enforcement's always just like, oh, wow, let me see it. That's awesome. You know, it's a conversation starter. This one is you can't even see it. And if you check out our upcoming Urban Survival Series on Outdoor Core, you're going to see this knife, this knife, and three other knives with a pistol and a bunch of other stuff. I'm wearing shorts and a T-shirt walking through downtown, and I'm geared up. I mean, I could start a chaos. I could start some chaos. You can't even tell. Um, this is just, it's a nice slim design. And if you keep a little belly on you, you got to have that survival muscle, <laughs> as Ron Hood used to call it. <laughs> keep the survival muscle on you. You can cover up a lot of stuff under that Dunlop tire you carry around. So that's good. Well, thank now I'm feeling much better about myself. Yeah. Yeah. It's survival muscle, man. That's all it is. So what, what was that large fixed blade knife that you had? So the large fixed blade knife here, that's my primary survival knife. My one tool option, this is the Colonel. Mm -hmm. This is a knife that I designed many years ago. Um, this one is a scaled down one eighth inch model. Um, I like the traditional design of it. I kind of designed it when I was coming up with it, like the old Frontiersman kitchen knife. A lot of the old Frontiersmen, They'd go in, grab the biggest kitchen knife they had, and they're off to the wood. That's what they carry. So this is very similar to that big old chef's knife. That's why it's two inches wide. Uh, actually, this is a scale down. The original was two inches wide, but it was designed to fit my hand. So my thumb goes up here to the tip, and then it would come up here, curve, and I still have blade edge hanging out of my palm, and that was where I could work it, use it as a draw knife and shaver much more effectively. It's six inches long. Uh, I like the convex. It's a higher convex grind, so it's nice and thin. Gives good purchase when I'm carving into stuff. Of course, a 90 degree spine for me is a necessity on most mm -hmm. every knife. And then um, stabilized oak handles. So they're waterproof, tough as my carta, and um, does a job. So that's my primary go to belt knife. For survival you mentioned your your convex grind do you adjust grinds of knives you get from other manufacturers i generally don't um i try to keep them original as the knife comes um i'm a honer i don't really sharpen much okay. i'm constantly so if you get a good 
uh, blade edge. You tune it up initially once you get it. You know, factory edges are kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm. But um, tune it up once, get it where you want it, and then hone it forever. Um, you're going to get a lot of, lot of years out of that knife. Now, not counting chips, mm -hmm. which do occur on a lot of our super steels we have. They tend to chip. Um, you know, that, that's a different story. But um, I try to stick with uh, grinds, and I carry my knife based on where I'm going to be operating at the time. Uh, most of my classes are here in southern Indiana. Uh, north central Kentucky area. So I'm I'm really well equipped with a convex knife edge. When I go north, I prefer a Scandi. You know, if I'm up operating in Michigan, Minnesota, um, which I do on rare occasions, um, I prefer that Scandi because their woods are a little bit softer. Mm -hmm. When I go down south around your neck of the woods, um, it just depends. I kind of like, you know, I like a flat edge, you know, a flat grind a little bit. Um, I do a Scandi on occasion, but it's usually a backup knife, and I'm going to prefer my convex or my flat grind them. So, just kind of how I operate. With your honing, do you just hone on a ceramic rod, or you use a car window, or how do you hone? Yep. So, um, I'll show you. I always keep it right next to me. I have this Lansky Master Sharpener. This thing is just, uh, it's, it's fantastic for what it is. Um, you get two medium grit sharpening rods, two fine grit sharpening rods, and then you even have one for serrations. And here it has 17, 20, and 25 degree angles. So all you have to do is just set the rods in where you want them, and this protects your hand like that. And so if I'm just tuning up a knife real quick on this system, all I'm gonna do is just put it here on the rods and just slide it down just like that. And that's all there is to it. And then if I wanna take that wire edge that I get off, mm -hmm. I just have an old strop. This is the first survival tool I made like 20 something years ago, still going strong. And that's just a piece of leather I glued to a, a fence spindle or a deck spindle that I trimmed down. And uh, then I just, wipe it off on the leather. So I'll tune it up on my strop and I'm good to go. It's usually hair popping sharp, just like that. I mean, nothing much to it. Well, so thanks that's for, pretty much all I do, 100% of the time. Thanks for uh, bringing up the strop as well. That was gonna be my next question. Now, do you do it on a schedule or do you just, you, you kind of know when you're starting to lose that edge? Yeah, I mean, if I'm going out in the woods for a few days, these tools are gonna go with me at minimum my strop. I also carry, a, you know, I wear a leather belt, mm -hmm. so my belt is always my strop first, um, just because if I'm going out for a couple of days, I don't always want to carry this landscape thing yeah. with me. But as soon as I get back from the field, the first thing I do is when I'm relaxed, getting everything put away, I'll sit down and I'll hone everything up. I'll get everything back to how I like it, and then I'll oil it and put it away. So I do that after every single trip. That process for me is kind of like my my decompression. Yeah, exactly. Yep. You know, because I even noticed you use that word when you're relaxed, and that's kind of like, all right, I, just, I can just kind of chill out and do that process. Yep, um, exactly. All right, axe, hatchet, or tomahawk? What's your choice there? Well, let's see here. I've got, again, depending on what I'm doing, two is one, one is none. I'm gonna carry my axe. I always go for a 24 inch bushcraft axe. It's just what I prefer. Mm -hmm. um, the specific axe I do like is this Council Tool Woodcraft Pack Axe uh, on the 24 inch handle. The reason I like this axe so much is because I was around when it was designed. So I got to see the prototypes, I had a little input into its design. It's got that 90 degree sharpened spine on the top which is really rare for axes. And then the bit or the, you know, where it chops into the wood, it's got a shoulder here, but look how nice and thin that, that edge is. And that really bites really good into American hardwoods. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have that standard Scandi style axe grind on it. This is more suited for average American woodsman. And for me, I, it's like a laser, 
you know, out in the woods or maybe like a lightsaber almost. When I chop with this thing, it's just blowing trees up and it's got a good weight to it. Very comfortable to handle, about one and three quarter pounds. So to me, I love this thing. Um, that's my go-to ax. And then I always carry a smaller carving hatchet. And this is the S.E. Gibson ax. And um, again, this is special to me because I'm friends with James Gibson that designed this ax. I've seen the originals. Uh, he's one of my mentors. Um, it's actually one of the only axes designed. It's uh, designed after an, an old Roman horse, actually. So it sits down like so. So it's got the perfect balance point in it. So you can chop with it and then, of course, choke up on it for finer carving tasks. And that's what James designed it for, is a multi-use, uh, good carving axe. And so if I'm going to go out and just tinker about, I can throw this in a haversack on, my belt, on a belt loop, and I'm set. So those are my two choices on axes and hatchets. Uh, do you or have you ever had to rehang your own heads? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, not as often anymore. Um, when I was younger, I, uh, it seemed like I was always overstriking very constantly, you know, and I'm booger them up right through here. That's why you see so many leather mm -hmm. and duct tape and cord wraps all through here just to keep those handles from being boogered up. Um, it's really just about more control. And now that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting lazier as I get older. I don't want to have to fix everything all the time. So I'm a little more cautious when I do things a little more purposeful. And that's really what it boils down to is we just need to slow down and realize what we're doing. Um, master the basics, good safety, good technique. And that's going to take you further uh, and last longer than being in a rush all the time. Do you, do you insist on rehanging your own or do you, do I have trouble giving that trust away. You know, um, I'll, there are certain people, I'll hand it to uh, and let them deal with it for me. Very few, but like Jamie Burley, you know, uh, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with yeah. Jamie, he and I are buddies and he's here all the time. He's on his way here right now, as a matter of fact. But um, he rehung this one and did this handle all up. I mean, he's a craftsman that knows exactly what he's doing. So I can just say, hey, here's a bucket of axe heads, deal with it, and it's fine. Uh, the ones I've rehung, I generally just don't have time anymore to do it. So that's my biggest problem is time. Um, if I'm trying to decompress and I need a little side project, that's the time I'll go and mess with one. But um, I have a handful of people that I'll allow to do it. But you're right. It's a personal thing. Um, it really can make or break uh, me wanting to even continue using the axe. If it's a bad hang or it just doesn't fit right, I'll sell the axe. I, it's that big of a deal to me just to avoid it. I'll, I've actually sold tools uh, just because I didn't like the way they were hung. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm weird. And then when you hang, do you um, fashion your own handle or do you, do you buy one that's stock and modify it? I'll buy a stock one and modify it. Mm -hmm. I've only done my own handle one time. I was not that happy with it. Um, after I did it, uh, started from scratch, went from the log and, you know, worked it on down and did all that. I've only done that one time. Very time consuming. Um, and again, I'm one that I would rather pay good money for someone else's quality work than, than pick my yeah. own work apart constantly. Mm -hmm. So I'd re much rather not do it at all because I know if I did, I'm always going to find something wrong. Right, so. right. All right. How about your saw? Okay. Saws. I have changed recently and I used to be a Baco Laplander guy. Used it for many years. That's all I used exclusively. But I've changed over to the Silky Saws uh, the past two years. And I've got the Dom Boy and that's the one I'm running with currently on the big one. Uh, this is the Gomboy Curve. It's a 240 millimeter blade. It's got the aggressive teeth on there, as you can see, hopefully. Um, this is my general use saw. Then I've got the Pocket Boy. I love this because it's lightweight. Um, fits literally in my pocket. And I've got the fine tooth model on this one. 
So if I'm doing traps, triggers, etc., cetera, uh, making projects, I want the fine tooth. And if I'm just hogging off some wood, I'll go to the other one. Then of course I got the boreal takedown buck saw. This, anytime I carry an ax, this is with my ax all the time. I carry them in the same bag. Um, I have an ax sling we make and uh, I carry, I've been using the Agawa uh, Canyon saws since they came out. So it's been several years. Mm -hmm. um, I, they are fantastic. Never had a problem with it. And so I've upgraded to the 24 inch over the 21. And um, pretty much fall and winter months are the only time I'm going to even carry a full size ax and a big saw like that. All summer, all spring, you're not going to see me with an ax and saw. You just won't. Uh, spring and summer, this is all I'm carrying, and ninety percent of the time it's just there. All right, good. Well, I was I was gonna I was gonna press you on that because I've been I've been letting you bring multiple things to the party, and I was about to say, all right, you get one saw, you get one axe. What are you going with? Yeah, if I have one, just one option, I'm gonna go with the. Um, uh, truthfully, I would probably go with the big combo. I just take this okay. because I can do finer carving with this thing. And whatever this won't do fine carving on, that's what I have a knife for, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be my one saw and one axe if I'm limited to that. Um, if I'm limited to one knife, um, I'm going to probably just take this, the, the big kernel, uh, because it's literally at this point, it's uh, almost 10 years old now On uh, since I came up with it. I've used it so much. It's literally an extension of my hand. So I can do everything with this. I have done everything with this. So um, I would just go with that. It's been a lot of fun to do some of these because you mentioned something that I'm learning and I, I've realized this in myself and as I've talked with other bushcrafters and survivalists, you know, you kind of get to this point where it's like, listen, I know that by the numbers, this isn't the one, but it's the one that's an extension of my arm. You know, and really the, so much of it comes down to, you even alluded to it a little bit earlier and in your book about, you know, the slow and the smooth. And I think that also comes along with the being familiar, being comfortable with it. You know, right. you can have, you know, the, the best knife in the world. If you're not as comfortable with it as you are with your Amora knife, mm -hmm. then you're just, you're not going to be happy using it. It's going to be dangerous because you're not going to know what it can do when far as good and bad. Right. And, you know, honestly, what I use on a more regular basis, you know, if I'm in a class, I'm going to be using this because everybody that's coming to a class, they're bringing these with them. That's mm -hmm. what they see on YouTube. That's what they see on survival TV. So that's what they're bringing. So I'll, I'll join them and I'll show them how to use it. We all start somewhere. Yeah. Me personally, I'm carrying neck knives, little bitty neck knives. And if you can't do it with a little neck knife, you probably don't need to be trying to do it with a big knife. Right. You, know? um, you get to a point to where you're just using these, you know, a little three, three and a half inch bladed things. Um, I can do everything with this just as easily as I can with the big knife. Um, it's just going to change my strategy a little bit more. Um, I get more specialized in the little bitty thing that's curved. Now I've got a, a little bit more limitation because of the knife style, but I'm not going to be hacking down trying to baton through chunks of wood to make malls and woodcraft tools either. So if we're talking survival for a couple days, this this is more than I need. This is fine. Um, you know, I've seen Creek Stewart use those little bitty mam yeah. pocket fruit knives, and I've always thought they were junk. But when I see him using them, I'm like, good grief, he's amazing with those things. So I knew it was a me problem. You know, it's just I haven't spent enough time with that tool to get comfortable with it. And he can do anything with those things. So that was really what motivated me to master my tool use a little bit more. And so that's what I've worked on for the past few years is just getting more comfortable with a smaller, uh, smaller selection of tools and learning that it's really not the tool. You know, when you if you ask me what's your favorite knife, the one I have in my hand. Oh, I love that answer. Yeah, I mean, 
It really is. I don't have, I have hundreds, uh, maybe not hundreds. I keep selling them off. I have hundreds of knives probably. And the one I have in my hand at the time is the one I love at the moment. And it'll do the job. So. Yeah, the tool you have is much better than the tool you don't. Exactly. <laughs> All right, your wild card. Okay, my wild card. Um, again, talking urban carry, non-permissive. Uh, you got to get through the airport or do something sneaky. I like a G10. Uh, people poker, I'll say, or a people zipper, we call them. Um, this is designed for one thing, and that's self-defense. So in areas that I can't carry a firearm, I don't carry a firearm very much or very often. Um, I'm more of a knife guy because of my background and training. Um, I like to carry a G10 tool, um, get through metal detectors pretty easily. Um, it's avoided in pat downs. You can carry it center line. So if you do have a firearm, it works in unison with your firearm, you know. Mm -hmm. um, that's my wild card. I like G10 tools. And more often than not, I like to improvise my tools. So um, if I get in situations, again, talking day-to-day -day suburban, urban environment. I don't always carry a pocket knife with me. I don't carry an EDC like we say we're supposed to do. I don't. Mm -hmm. um, I like to use my mind a lot. I like to use my body as a weapon because I'm a ninja. But, <laughs> but um, I like to make my tools and craft things from the surrounding. And once you start working your mind in that way, you realize that Virtually anything can be a tool. Uh, I like learning how to rely on found pieces of metal and sharp rocks and bones that I've found to use to do woodland tasks. I can tell you it takes 486 chops with a sharpened edge of a horse jaw to chop through a four inch cedar sapling. Um, and that is gonna depend on how much you sharpen that jaw. And if you sharpen it with a rock, took me 486 strikes and I could not use my arm for the entire next day. So it, that's the kind of stuff I like to experiment with and, and try. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with tool use. I, I have to say I'm, I'm both a little bit impressed and a little bit scared that you actually counted out how many chops it was going to take. Well, was, you know, I was getting paid to do it. So <laughs> Okay, well, all right then. Then I'm just impressed. I'm not scared anymore. Right. <laughs> Well, great. Hey, thanks. I enjoyed it. You um, you really brought a perspective of it um, that uh, we haven't seen yet in these interviews of, of that self-defense aspect. So I appreciate you bringing that to the table. Where can people go to learn more about uh, what you're up to? You can learn more by going to our website at campcraftoutdoors.com. If you find free downloads, blogs, and information on everything we have going on, then, of course, you can always find us on Instagram and Facebook under Camp Craft Jason uh, on both of those platforms. And, um, hey, we're going to link to the stuff. We're going to link to the book. Um, I'm not going to give too much away here, but I'm going to say, like, to the viewers, watch for Jason's name. Just, I'm telling you, just watch for it. Um, there's some really cool stuff uh, coming up that we were talking about a bit ago, and I can't wait to see what you got going on next. Awesome. Thank you.